Thank you for joining us for Sermons on Demand from Friendship Grace Brethren Church. We provide these videos as a way to share the pulpit messages and teachings offered at Friendship Grace Brethren Church. If you find these videos a helpful resource, please drop us a note at info at friendshipgracebrethren.com. Now open your Bibles and get ready to dig into the Word of God. Okay, any uh, any questions this week that I don't already have? Or comments or statements or complaints? I'm still not fond of Ecclesiastes. Well, it's wisdom literature. Well, I like the others. Just Ecclesiastes is hard to way through us personally speaking well, we're, we're gonna we're gonna talk about ecclesiastes in a little bit i'm not a fan of any of the wisdom literature i talked about this last week because i want things cut and dried and i don't i don't like things that are interpretive very much um so anyway no no questions or comments You guys are making this easy. <laughs> okay, here we go. I got a sneeze stuck, so if I sneeze, you'll know. Oh, okay. man. Proverbs 28.5 states, Evil men do not understand justice, but those who seek the Lord understand it completely. Recognizing this is wisdom literature, how should this verse impact how you speak with others with an intent to gather them to Jesus? And can you think of other non-wisdom literature passages that support the principle seen in this verse? Evil men do not understand justice, but those who seek the Lord understand it completely. The one in Romans 1. I think it's Romans 1 that says the gospel is foolishness to them. You, you mean uh, you mean this one? For I'm not ashamed of the gospel, for it's the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. For it is the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith, as it is written, the righteous shall live by faith. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and, un and unrighteousness of men who by their unrighteousness suppress the truth, for what can be known about God is plain to them because God has shown it to them. For his invisible attributes, namely his eternal power and divine nature, have been clearly perceived ever since the creation of the world in the things that have been made, so they are without excuse. For although they knew God, they did not honor him as God or give thanks to him, but they became futile in their thinking and their foolish hearts were darkened. Claiming to be wise, they became fools and exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images resembling mortal man and birds and animals and creeping things. Therefore God gave them up to the lust of their hearts, to impurity, to dishonoring of their bodies among themselves, because they exchanged the truth about God for a lie and worshiped and served the creature rather than the Creator who is blessed forever. Amen. I can continue on, but I won't. <laughs> I was wrong in the book, 1 Corinthians 1, 18, for the message of the cross is foolishness to those who don't believe. Right. Yeah. Or the That's fool has said in his heart, there is no God, short and sweet. Right, but uh, Sybil, isn't that one from Proverbs? Oh, you did. Psalms? There's one, Psalms, a couple places it says okay. that in Psalm. Okay. Yeah. yeah. But probably I, the same difference. Yeah. Right? Yeah. <laughs> and and I wanted non-wisdom literature to support that, but you're right, Sybil. So we have two, 1 Corinthians, Corinthians and Romans, Romans 1. Right. And and the Psalms principle, non-one that's a wisdom literature one, but so here here's the deal. In in what what uh, we see in the past in the verse that evil men don't understand justice it's really not that they don't understand it it's that they reject it according to what paul says right they're they're not going to do what's right because that's not what they want to do and those who seek the lord understand it completely we have in our 
in our uh, dispensation, we have the indwelling of the Holy Spirit, and we have the way to, to know what God wants from us through the direct work of the Holy Spirit. Evil man doesn't have that. Non-believers don't have that kind of influence, and they've rejected what, what Paul tells us here in Romans 1 is clearly seen, but they suppress it because they don't want it. So even though Proverbs 28.5 is a, is a part of wisdom literature, is a proverb, not a hard and fast law, not a promise, it is still backed up by other parts of Scripture. So the principle there is that, that the unrighteous, they're not going to turn to God. They're not going to follow God. Only the ones that have, um, that, that who seek the Lord will have that kind of understanding. Who seeks the Lord? Those he's called. Right. No one seeks unless he draws them. And so the only way you're going to understand what God wants is to have been drawn by him and he indwells you with the Holy Spirit and gives you the ability. I, I was reading that, that verse or that, that section this morning, as, or I guess it was this afternoon. It was a really busy day today, so kind of got messed up on me. But um, when I was working on that today, and, and I read back through this passage, and I thought I had not seen, directly seen that statement before. Evil men don't understand justice, but those who seek the Lord understand it completely. That's, that's a great saying, a great proverb that's backed up by, by uh, other parts of Scripture. And I, I really appreciated that. I I'm just what, not sure about the completely because I don't think I understand anything in Scripture completely. No, none of us wondering. none of us do. None of us can because Scripture is, for one thing, Scripture is written by an infinite God, and we're finite, and so there are naturally going to be antinomies in there that we just can't comprehend. We, That's we why can't. I'm going. I don't like that word completely there. Yeah, you probably need to to view that less as everything but with full confidence yeah that could go in with yeah questions or comments on that wouldn't it also be backed up to bridge i don't know first we're talking but in the old testament bar it towards uh somewhere in five books of the pentateuch where god hardens their hearts i mean they're not they're not, They're not going, going to, to do it because the hearts, hearts are hardened by God, God until, until he draws them. Yeah, certainly. Um, th that, that's a, if you were in a seminary class right now, the professor would say that's bordering on double predestination. That, that he predestined those that would be saved and he predestined those who wouldn't be saved. A, a lot of the Christian world rejects that. I, I don't know how logically you can, but um, your statement is absolutely correct. Unless he draws them, they're they're going to have hard hearts, and if the only way they can ha ha not have hard hearts is that he draws them, the fact that he doesn't draw them is his action, and so he's mm -hmm. chosen them um, to not. So um, that's very true. Isn't that in the Gospel of John somewhere around ten? Okay. What, un unless he draws them? No man comes from Father, it says he draw them. Yeah. Well, the one well, somewhere is in Romans 8, eight too. Romans 8, 8 28, 28, and so, and so forth. forth. Right. Yeah. 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 I think it's in John somewhere as well. <laughs> okay, very good. <sighs> I'm trying to like the wisdom literature more, so I'm looking for more jewels in it. So, <laughs> With that in mind, then, what is the theme and intent of the book of Ecclesiastes? Uh, vanity of vanity, all is vanity. <laughs> That's correct. Vanity of vanity, says the preacher. Vanity of vanities, all is vanity. Or, 
That, that's right at the beginning in, in chapter 1, verse 2. Or in chapter 12, verse 8, vanity of vanity, says the preacher, all is vanity. He, he bookends the, the entire book with a statement that everything's vanity. What does that mean? Well, the word vanity is translated smoke or vapor. All, right. everything, that, everything that we have or that we think we want to attain or accomplish is just a, a vapor that vanishes because it's, it's not eternal. It doesn't come from God. Linda, you were muted. What did you say? Do as I say, not as I do. Not as I do because I've done that. It didn't work. Yeah. Oh, like that. Yeah, as uh, as Mary said, uh, the the word uh, um, that we translate as vanity, it's the Hebrew word chabal, and it has a range of translations from vapor, breath, or sometimes translated something vain, darkness, or the absence of something, nothingness, void, and a whole range of interpretations in between. It is also spelled exactly the same as Adam's son, Abel. I, I saw that when I was stuttering the word, and I go, what kind of principle can I draw from that? And as I continued to read on about the word, the, uh, the lexicon advised caution because of the potential difference in spelling with us only having the consonants. Um, that there probably is no link, but I think it could preach well that there's a link between the dead Abel and uh, um, and uh, vanity. I think that would preach a sermon somewhere. And what does the word hovel mean? Um, it has a range of translations from vapor, breath, something vain, darkness, nothingness, void. And every kind is, of is, is Hubble the same spelling as Abel? Yeah, in uh, in Hebrew, yes. Okay. 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 Got it. Remember, in ancient Hebrew, we have no vowels. So it just has the same consonants. Right. Was it the spell the same? We don't know. In most most modern Hebrew text, we now have vowel pointings, and those vowel pointings are the same for the name of Adam's son and what we have translated vanity here. But the lexicons caution not to draw any conclusion from that. Can't imagine Adam, Adam wanted to call Abel vanity or smoke or nothing business. Yeah. That would be weird. Yeah. So, well, so what about uh, who called yes, him he, uh, he, puny and uh, those, were the those were the daughters from a uh, daughter in laws from Ruth. Ruth. Right. No, those were the sons. No, those were the sons. No, those were the sons. that meant puny and um, something else. Malon and Killian. Yeah. Puny and whining. They were the sons, not the daughters. Oh, right. right, right. I wouldn't call them that either. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, if if you think of our word, I'm going to start out with the bat, 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 bit, bat. Oh yeah. A bat with bat, she a bat with you. Five different words, five different meanings. Right. So without the vowels, it's it's dangerous to make any kind of conclusion. I, it just struck me as, as really interesting, and apparently it did to the lexographer, lexographers as well, because m many of them talked about it, how it was the same word, but then don't draw a conclusion from that. It just It's just interesting to me. I, I, it's one of those things when you're studying, you go, huh, I wonder what that means. So... The, the word is used in the form that we, ha that we have it that translated as vanity. It's used 36 times in the book of Ecclesiastes. So clearly the author is talking about things that, that produce nothingness, that, that are worthless, that are as, as a puff of smoke or a breath of air, gone. So clearly that, that's part of what he's talking about. 
It seems like, to me at least, it's all about what a man has and can do, provides nothing of value eternally for him. There is nothing that you can do. I mean, let's look at let's look at who Solomon was. He was the most wealthy, <coughs> wise, famous. Yeah, he, he he had everything. He was good looking. He could have any girl he wanted. He had all the money in the world. He had all the prestige in the world, and he could do nothing to save himself. And he, he didn't pack up one of those gold chariots and take it with him to his grave. That's right. No, no. It's like it's often said, you know, there's no trailer hitch on a hearse. That boy. So he he's talking about his his desire to have it all and ultimately come to the conclusion none of it's worth anything. That's the theme of the book. This final statement, I think, is the best conclusion. Which is? Fear God and keep his commandments, for this is the whole duty of man. Yeah. For God will bring every deed into judgment with every secret thing, whether good or evil. I think that's what Solomon finally figured out. Right. But look what he went through to get to that point. So maybe, so maybe we, we should pay attention, attention so we don't have to go through all that. <laughs> well, I'm going to address that in a in a subsequent question. So just keep that thought into the back of your head. Or if you're like me and you need it in the front of your head, because everything in the back of your head's gone. Okay. Read Proverbs twenty nine eighteen. Where there is no prophetic vision, the people cast off restraint, but blessed is he who keeps the law. What is the principle of this proverb? How can we apply that principle today? In another version, does it say where there is no, uh, where there is no prophetic vision, the people perish? Well, let me just pull up all my versions and... Uh, and see. What was the twenty Proverbs twenty nine eighteen? Okay, here. The King James says, "Where there is no vision, the people cast off restraint." Okay, it must uh, be a different verse then. then. The Lexham, okay, uh, where there is no prophecy, the people cast off restraint. The Net, where there is no prophetic vision, cast off restraint. NASB, um, where there is no vision, the people are unrestrained. NIV 84, where there is no revelation, the people cast off restraint. So it seems like everybody's focused on restraint. But you know, in the ESV on the U version, when you hit those three little dots beside the word, then it comes up where the people are discouraged. So they're telling you that restraint there is discouraged? Yeah, yes, that's what those, those little dots mean. Yep, yeah, that's, uh, that's apparently a, a variant translation of that word. And that is the word... That's interesting. Well, my Hebrew is not any good at today. Um, it is the word pr. Uh-huh. Par- I didn't quite. quite. <laughs> par- is that really a pr? <laughs> par- yeah, it means to <laughs> let go, let alone to loose, to let go. Um, let free, make someone go out of control, allow to run wild, leave unattended. It's translated in various ways as loose, unbind, go, neglect, avoid, cast, take, sinfully, hang, ignored, or ignores. Uh-huh. 
there you go. Okay, so, so it sounds, sounds like, like uh, people, people today. today. Yeah. They have no, they have <laughs> yeah. no prophetic yeah. indication goes. goes. So, if people don't believe the word of God, yeah. and you see there is no restraint. Right, that's, that's the entire point. Let, let's define what the word of God is, or what uh, prophetic vision is. The precepts of God. What exactly. God tells us to, to do. Exactly. We when, had friends there with the Lord. They were teachers of the known lady. And they said, ever since we took out prayer of the Bible, and of course they're now with the Lord, they don't even know what's going on now, but they said that 30 years ago. How can we, how can we expect, of course we can't expect, they just said that, for God to protect the schools when we don't, when we don't want him to be in the school. Right. That's what Jim and Nancy said. Well, they were absolutely correct. Yeah, when, what, uh... Okay, King James Version has it this way. I knew there was somewhere where it was perish. Where there is no vision, the people perish. Oh, yeah, they cast off all restraint. They're ignoring God. They're not safe. They're going to perish. Yeah. I kept thinking, why do I think perish? <laughs> I thought I because read to King. me, it doesn't matter. It's just that I was I was confused because I'm going. To me, there's a difference between cast off restraint and perish. That's why I'm thinking. Why why do I think that? Anyway, yes. What uh, what version are you reading that in? King James, out of the. Out of the you heard? No, I'm in. Um, Olive tree, which is the poor man's version of Logos. Because the, the translation the, of Logos. Oh, King, King I see. James. Yeah, yeah. I that, that's old, old King James. That's the authorized version. Um, very old. Where there is no vision, the people perish. Yeah, because that's how I memorized it once upon a time, and I can think. Why do I think that? But that's what it is. But now I understand. Yeah, the New King James, uh, um, the people cast off restraint. It's obvious that cast off restraint is a better translation than perish. Yeah. yeah. So, so I memorized uh, it. And we saw this when we were looking at Romans uh, 1 earlier. Absent the effect of the Word of God on us, there are no limits to the depravity of God that, uh, that the, or the, 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 Talk much, the depravity of the world. Sorry, yes. And, and there, there's no limit to what the world will do. I mean, we see that in our modern world all the time. If if you look at the uh, devolution of society, as uh, as Sybil was pointing out, it began when society began to to reject biblical values. When when. Uh, when when this country was founded, it may not have been founded by all Christians, but they all maintained a sense of biblical values and they regularly taught biblical values. And when we slowly started moving those out of our society, our society stopped having a real firm value system. We are long past having a firm value system here. Yep. Yeah. Number one is free in our government are good Catholic people. Zero value system. Zero. Yeah, I wouldn't call them good Catholics. I wouldn't call them good. That's what they call themselves. That's right. what they call them. Right. But good Catholic, if you are a good observant Catholic, it doesn't mean you have a necessarily a biblical value system. Because remember, Catholics have the word of the Pope at the same level as the word of God. And over the last 2,000 years, or actually 1,500 years, the, the Pope has conflicted with other Popes. So one or both have to be wrong. If, uh, if that's the case. 
where you don't have that in 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 uh, scripture. So I, I I wouldn't ever accuse somebody of being good because they're a an observant Catholic. They have a morality that the, the they have a morality that the rest of the world may not have, but they don't know the word of God and they're not Bible centric. They're not God focused. But you're right. They they claim to be good Catholics, except the Archbishop out in uh, California now has denied um, communion to Pelosi. And remember that for the Catholic, that's a big deal because grace is conveyed by the sacraments, and that's one of the seven sacraments. And so she, according to their doctrine, she gets less grace because she can't attend communion. So I don't even know how that's a debate with with Catholic archbishops and uh, and cardinals why they why they have this debate going on. Of course you should deny it to her. She denies the authority of the church. So you should deny it, but they don't. So, but finally, there's one that has cojones and did. <laughs> That's been, our, that's been my personal biggest struggle with Joanna is she's been raised very Catholic. Her mom's Catholic. She's Catholic. And she's politically she's very liberal. And so I have a firm understanding that there is no salvation there. Yeah, that, that's why I, when I sent out the prayer request that, that God would reach through that in the last days and uh, that she would come to a saving knowledge. God can do that. Whether or not he chose her and will do that, that's a different story. But he can do that. And that's hard. Because even in all the liturgy, people can be saved because I'm quite convinced that Tons of East Bet was, was a believer. Because I talked to her about it. I uh, I worked for a for a sheriff that was a Catholic and he was he was uh, in uh, in seminary graduated from seminary and decided to get married rather than uh, become a priest and uh, I made two or three long trips with him to uh, Tallahassee just he and I in a car and uh, he claimed he was a believer he understood. And I said, you understand then that the doctrine of the Catholic Church is not correct when it comes to salvation. He said, yes, I understand. And I said, then, with all due respect, sir, why the hell are you still there? Because it's wrong. And he said, I only have an opportunity to talk to them if they accept me as them. Now, whether or not that happened, I don't know. That's, that was his response to me. You, you, you can't be a good Catholic an observant Catholic, observing the doctrine of the Catholic Church, and be a real Christian. Because the Catholic doctrine does not allow for that. Because your your grace comes from the sacraments in participation with Jesus on the cross. And that is counter-biblical teaching. So so if if our if our aunt with the finger up her nose is what truly was a believer she she had to not accept catholic doctrine that's the problem she didn't accept every, every yeah, yeah she, she didn't, didn't accept, accept every doctrine. doctrine yeah and so so she can't she wasn't a good catholic although she was a lifelong um uh, nun yes yes and so there there are those problems yes, yes. and she knew, and she knew it. it she knew it she knew it Okay, but let's they move can't on. Know the truth. Well, we'll we'll uh, when we get to heaven, we'll we'll have an opportunity to to find out who said get away who who was told get away from me. I never knew you. I I think we'll be surprised at who's there, and we'll be surprised mm-hmm. at who's not there. Yeah. Okay. Next. Next up. Oops. How do you rationalize Deuteronomy 7, 1 through 5, and I'll read it here in a minute, and the great blessings God gave 
Solomon. Thinking about what we've read recently about all the blessings God gave Solomon. Listen to what God gave Moses in Deuteronomy. When the Lord your God brings you into the land that you are entering to take possession of it, and clears away many nations before you, the Hittites, the Girgashites, the Amorites, the Canaanites, the Perizzites, the Hivites, and the Jebusites, seven nations more numerous and mightier than you. And when the Lord your God gives them over to you, and you defeat them, then you must devote them to complete destruction. You shall make no covenant with them, and show no mercy to them. You shall not intermarry with them, giving your daughters to their sons, or taking their daughters for your sons. For they would turn away your sons from following me to serve other gods. Then the anger of the Lord would be kindled against you and would destroy you quickly. But you shall deal with them and you shall break down the altars and dash, their pe dash in pieces their pillars and chop down their ashram and burn their carved images with fire. Oops, went too far. Okay, so how do you rationalize that? God said he was angry with Solomon for doing that, and that he was going to take the kingdom away, but not from him, but from his son. But he violated this big time. Yes, that's why God was angry with him. Okay. He was going to take the kingdom away from him. But because of David, he was going to show mercy and take it not away from Solomon, but uh -huh. from his son. Okay. But don't ask me where in First Kings that is, or Second Kings or First Chronicles, maybe nine. The other way around. We read, we read it in First Kings ten. I think there we read it the other mm -hmm. day. Yes. It's abundantly clear that that Solomon violated these instructions. It's really abundantly clear that Israel violated these instructions. Uh, Solomon led people in uh, the people of Israel in doing the exact same thing, right? Yet God blessed Solomon more than any other king of Israel. We know from the early years of Solomon that he was focused on doing what was right. He was focused on doing what God had said, but his attraction to women and the pragmatism that he approached women violated the trust he had with God and so, as Mary said, God punished him. Could it be a little bit, not that it's an excuse, could it be a little bit that Solomon said, my dad couldn't build a temple because he was a man of war. I'm going to marry all those women so there are not wars that God is pleased with me. Is that how he could have rationalized it? Well, I think so, and, and and when we look at when we look at First Kings uh, eleven, we see that. Now, King Solomon uh, loved many foreign women, along with the daughter of Pharaoh, Moabite, Ammonite, Edomite, Sidonian, and Hittite women, from the nations concerning which the Lord had uh, had said to the people of Israel, "You shall not enter into marriage with them, neither shall they with you, for they surely will turn your heart." after their gods, Solomon clung to, uh, to these in love. He had 700 wives who were princesses, that's a very important part to remember, and 300 concubines, and his wives turned away his heart. Um, verse 4, for when Solomon was old, his wives turned away his heart after their god, after other gods, and his heart was not wholly true for the Lord as his, um, as his god as was the heart of David, his father. So your, your point is absolutely correct. And verse 3 here tells us, he had 700 wives who were princesses. Not because they married him. They were princesses that he married. These were marriages of pragmatism, marriages of political value, so that, as Sybil pointed out, could have peace. He was the wealthiest and most peaceful of the, of the kings because he married their, the daughters of all the chiefs and kings from all the region around. 
every tribe had a chief and he found their daughter and married her. So now no longer could they have war with him. Poor boys. So his his what, what what was his problem in doing that? Well, he was he wasn't trusting God to give him peace. He was trusting the political alliances. Exactly. So his and the end of verse is it. His wives turned away his heart, and then was it in verse 4 or verse 3 where it says, David, yeah, this one, his, his heart was not with God like his father. Right. So even though David did some not-so-good things, he was committed to doing what, he, what the Lord wanted him to do, for the, for the best, best of, of to the best, the best of his, his ability, ability. Right. I mean, he wasn't and, and solomon just put that all aside yeah he he was being pragmatic and probably he uh, like sybil said he probably rationalized i'm getting peace where there wasn't peace while he was violating what god told him and told israel to not do why did he not get treated like Nebuchadnezzar? Because he was actually pretty much walking in his own pride. Yeah, that's a that's an interesting question. Why God chooses to punish at some times and not at others? I think there's a little bit of a hint here in verse four of First Kings eleven. For when Solomon was old, his wives turned away his heart. Mm -hmm. So for the majority of his of his reign, he he walked the straight and narrow, with the exception of having all these wives. They hadn't yet turned his heart, but then when he's old, he's he's less able to withstand their their pressure, and they he turns. Mm -hmm. He he was well, guilty he all, all along. Well, he even said to Pharaoh's daughter, she has to live outside Jerusalem. She cannot live for with the holy stuff. Right, right. So it's not like he didn't know he was sinning. He just didn't respond to what God said would happen until late in his life. <coughs> but I liken this to what a, uh, a philosopher of the uh, 20th century said in a, uh, in a uh, um, devotional to youth is it ever right to do wrong in order to get a chance to do right? No. Chuck, do you remember that philosopher? Yes, I do. Okay. But, but most people that forget him is a very forgettable person. <laughs> who was he? Or who is he? That was Chuck himself in a... Uh, in a uh, youth uh, a youth rally uh, devotional, when we had a lock in at the old Fort Myers Rec Center, he, wow. he was talking to the teenagers from all over the district and uh, asked the asked them the question: "It is ever right to do wrong in order to get a chance to do right?" And that's what that's what uh, Solomon did. He he, I, I, Sybil, I think I think you were right on top of it when you said he rationalized it by thinking I can have peace which his father couldn't have by uh, marrying all these women. Any questions on that? Solomon was pragmatic in his, uh, in his theology rather than being uh, spiritual in his theology. And he wasn't turning to uh, to God very well in that. I don't know how he could be married to seven hundred and have three hundred concubines. That's a hundred women. No, a that's a thousand women. You lost a zero. Yeah. I mean, that's just boggling. Well, as as our old friend used to say, that ain't right. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> and if they were wearing stockings that day, I had to go through the bathroom and get through the shower. Well, th that's why he built them each their own house. 
<laughs> he wouldn't even know the names of all of them. He wouldn't recognize them all. No. And, and, and to think of those marriages as a conventional marriage is today, is, that, that's not what we're talking about. These were political okay. marriages. I was just going to say, weren't they political arrangements? Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. He cared for them. Right. Whether or not he had sexual relationships with all of them is, is unknown. But in the standard operating way of the time, they didn't. They had one or two wives that were their primary wives, and all the rest were political convenience. Crazy. It is crazy. And as Les used to say, that ain't right. No, no, that ain't right. That ain't right. Uh, okay, for uh, for our last question today. No, I don't want to do that one. Okay. <laughs> well, it, it, it's not important enough to take up the last couple minutes. Thinking of the totality of Scripture, or to the totality of the message of Scripture... Why is the account of Solomon and his great wisdom important? Why did God put the, mess, the, 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 the account of Solomon into the text and then preserve it for us so that 3,500 years later, well, uh, 3,000 years later, that we read about it? Why is it important? All the wisdom doesn't help if you don't have a heart for God, like David. Okay, that's a pretty good statement of a principle. All the wisdom in the world doesn't help if you don't have a heart for God, if you're not obedient. What else do we learn? I love how Tara Lee asks the, asks the question every time. How does this make us see God? Or how do you see God? What is your God shot, as she says, yeah. in seeing this? I think it shows that no matter how smart knowledgeable how much wisdom you have you still can't live on live without God okay but don't confuse smart and wisdom they're not the same well no anybody else I think there are a number of things that are illustrated about this first of all I think we see that God keeps his promises both positive and negative. God told him what he needed to do and he didn't do it. And so God punished. Yeah. Samuel said to Saul, obedience is better than sacrifice. Exactly. That goes for Solomon, that goes for us, that goes to Yep, God promised him that if, listen, if you turn from following me, it's not going to go well for your family and for your people. And after and, all the, the ways that God blessed him, not just the wisdom, but the material blessings, he still got distracted by a bunch of women. Right. Yep. Right. I think the message that is conveyed in, this, in the account of, uh, of Solomon is is multifaceted you can have all the wealth in the world you can have all the wisdom in the world you can have everything that you could ever want and if you're not obedient to god it's nothing as he plainly tells us in the book of ecclesiastes i had it all and it did nothing for me to get to heaven chuck yeah Oh, I thought I thought I saw your side light up that you had something to say. No, no. Okay. So the 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 account of Solomon gives us lots of pictures of God, of what God expects, and how 
all of the stuff we can accumulate is, to use his words, nothingness apart from God. It is part of the building blocks of the progressive revelation of God revealing to us who he is. You know, I it always. Also shows, it also shows that God keeps his promises because God told Solomon that um, because he only asked for wisdom, he'd give him all this other stuff. Right. So God blessed him in spite of himself, not because of himself. Yeah, God kept his promise both negative and positive. Right, right. Mm-hmm. Yeah, God's God's character demanded that he punish Israel and uh, and Solomon, and he did. But God's character also demanded that he uh, reward Solomon, and he did. And so there are there are all sorts of principles you can derive from this uh, this account of Solomon. I I always say. When when you're studying a passage of scripture, passage of scripture, you have to figure out why it's there. Who's it written to? Who is it written by? What's the purpose of it being written? You know, it's it's not just a historical document. As good as it is for that, it's more than that. There's there's a message being conveyed, and in this case, there's there's multiple messages, multiple principles being conveyed that are important for us to see. Questions or comments? Thank you for watching or listening to this teaching on demand from Friendship Grace Brethren Church. Please consider sending us an email at info at friendshipgracebrethren.com to let us know how this teaching may have helped you. Please also consider joining us in person at Friendship Grace Brethren Church, located at 10251 Metro Parkway, Suite 116, Fort Myers, Florida, just south of the intersection of Metro and Colonial Boulevard. Sunday school begins at 9 and worship service at 10 a.m. We look forward to seeing you in person at Friendship Grace Brethren Church.